In this lecture, uh, we'll be talking about um, sulfonamides. Okay, so we would be talking about the history and the pharmacology of sulfonamides. So sulfonamides were the first chemotherapeutic agents uh, which were used um, systemically for treating um, infections caused by bacterial pathogens. Okay, so it was the first chemotherapeutic agent used systemically. Uh, meaning it was given orally and then um, it would be absorbed into the bloodstream and then it would be having its effect. Okay? So it was used systemically for the treatment of infections caused by um, uh, microbial pathogens. Okay, and in this case, the microbes were bacteria. Okay. So, bacterial pathogens. Um, because it was the first chemotherapeutic agent, a discussion about um, the history of sulfonamides is in order. Okay. So, that's the reason why we need to um, learn the history of sulfonamides because the history of sulfonamides in essence is the history of um, antibiotics. Okay, so some dates are very important. Let me write it down first and then we would go and discuss what happened in those years. Okay, so first is 1675. Um, the next would be 1843, then we would have uh, 1861 and uh, 1871. Okay, so these um, years are um, important in the history of uh, sulfonamides. Okay, so. Let's see what happened in 1675. In 1675, there was a gentleman, and his name we all know as Anthony Phillips Van Leeuwenhoek. So this gentleman was a Dutchman, and um, he was the first to observe, he observed bacteria, okay, uh, using a, a, a microscope. Um, using a microscope handcrafted. Handcrafted uh, by himself. Okay? And so this microscope was handcrafted. And he was the first person to observe bacteria. Okay? And suddenly um, it was a leap in the understanding of the living world. So till that time, life was thought to be macro-organisms, meaning organisms that we could see with the unaided eye. So the leap in knowledge was the discovery of a whole range of microorganisms 
which could not be seen by the um, unaided eye. That was really um, a, a leap in our understanding. So intuitively, people begin to wonder whether um, diseases were caused by um, these microorganisms. Okay. And um, um, it was uh, uh, proved by Louis Pasteur that indeed bacteria could cause biochemical changes and uh, it was not a big leap of uh, imagination to, um, to, to think that bacteria could also cause disease. And so in 19, 1843, there was this gentleman called, uh, um, his name happens to be Oliver Wendell Holmes. So he was a physician in the, um, working in the United States. Um, and he was basically um, interested in um, uh, pure peril fever. Okay? Pure peril fever. So what is pure peril fever? It's basically fever that uh, is found um, one to three days after delivery, okay, in the mother. And at that time, this had a very, very high mortality rate. So it was associated with a very high mortality rate. So much so that some statistics um, suggest that uh, one in three women died um, at childbirth uh, due to this very, um, uh, very dangerous uh, fever. So this gentleman was interested in this and um, he had this um, uh, from his observation that um, um, he had this uh, idea that this pure peril fever was transmitted by physicians. The physicians who were delivering the um, women. Okay. So, um, so that was um, his uh, observation. Okay. So the reason being, women who were admitted for delivery, they were um, relatively healthy in the prime of their health. And after delivery, uh, he saw that there was an increased uh, mortality rate. And probably he observed uh, women who were not in the institutional setup and there the mortality rate was uh, probably less. And so he had this idea that this, uh, this fever was transmitted somehow by the uh, attending physicians. So in 1861, um, in Europe, um, Vienna, the capital of Austria, was the um, leading center for medical treatment. Okay, so if you had a very serious condition, then Vienna was the place that you went to. Okay. So in Vienna, at this point in time, there was uh, this uh, a medical student and uh, his name was uh, Ignis Philip Semmelweis. Okay. So he was a student and he was also observing um, the women who came for childbirth. And um, he also saw this um, 
this kind of alarming statistics in terms of increased mortality rate of the women who were um, delivering. So post-delivery, they had uh, um, this fever and eventually succumbed to it. So one of his professors uh, succumbed to um, this fever as well. And so this gentleman was devoted to his uh, professor, and so this professor was a professor of anatomy. And um, um, after the professor's death, um, Semmelweis observed the body of his uh, professor. And he found that the professor had uh, lesions which were similar to the lesions he had seen in the women who had died of puerperal fever. And so he thought, perhaps it was uh, the physician again um, who was uh, transmitting the infection. But uh, these two people did not correspond. Uh, and so they arrived at this, uh, this uh, conclusion independently. So what was suggested was, um, so he impressed upon his supervisor to make uh, the physicians uh, wash their hands in, uh, or dip their hands in chlorine water. Okay? And then only um, go for delivery. And what was observed was that there was a very significant decrease in the mortality rate. Um, sadly, um, Semmelweis uh, was not taken very seriously because uh, it was not um, even imaginable at that point in time that a physician could cause uh, disease. Um, bacteriology had not uh, developed as much as it has developed today. Uh, so there was this uh, surgeon in... Uh, England, his name is, uh, his name was uh, Joseph Lister. And he was a surgeon and he was also involved, uh, in, involved and interested in bacteriology. And he had also visited uh, Vienna at some point and he had learned about uh, the work done by Semmelweis. Um, so his own knowledge and perhaps um, insight from Semmelweis' work uh, led him to publish a seminal paper. And that paper happens to be um, on the antiseptic uh, principle for the practice of uh, surgery. Okay, on the antiseptic principle for the practice of surgery. So he laid down the um, antiseptic protocol for surgery. So what he used was um, what he called carbolic acid. Um, what he used was carbolic acid. And what is carbolic acid? It's uh, basically phenol. Okay. So, okay, so phenol. So um, his uh, observation was that wounds were... Um, um, those times not properly debrided, and he had observed increased mortality due to changes in the exposed uh, tissue. So his idea was, um, he followed up the work of uh, Louis Pasteur, and he thought maybe the air contained uh, organisms. So suppose this is the wound, okay, and um, um, he thought that uh, from following the work of Pasteur that there might be bacteria or microorganisms in the air and those might be um, falling down on the exposed tissue and that might be causing um, 
tissue changes, okay? Tissue changes that eventually led to, you know, undesirable um, physiological changes in the patients and sometimes that proved to be fatal um, because, uh, you know, patients would die of sepsis. And so his idea was, why can't you put a barrier like that, okay? So if you put a barrier, and his idea is uh, when the wound was exposed, during the time that the person had the wound or after he came to the institution, there might be these organisms which had found a refuge here. And so his idea was if you could uh, put uh, a covering, you could physically block the other organisms from settling, as well as if you could impregnate it with something that could kill, then perhaps it would be uh, beneficial. And so what he did was he sogged lint with uh, carbolic acid, put it on the wound, and surprise of surprises, uh, patients uh, recovered, and that led him to publish this seminal paper, and the practice of surgery um, changed overnight. Surgery became um, safer, and uh, uh, the mortality rate considerably reduced because of the antiseptic uh, principle propounded by Joseph Lister. He became the pioneer of antiseptic surgery. Oh, um, um, now this was not 1871, I'm sorry. Um, it was basically 1867, okay. Uh, so please note that correction. So this principle was followed up by other workers, other physicians and surgeons of the day. And by um, 1900s, uh, what they were using um, ranged from Iodine, which was famously um, discovered by the uh, French um, apothecary Courtois in um, 1811. Okay. Uh, uh, Courtois, it was in the year 1811. Okay, and then uh, we have just talked about uh, um, chlorine water and Joseph Lister using phenol. So there was uh, chlorine water, there was uh, phenol, and then there was something called uh, bichloride of mercury. So these um, agents were used uh, topically. So they were used uh, topically. Uh, for antisepsis. Okay, because maximum mortality happened because of sepsis. So what is sepsis? Okay, sepsis is when there is uncontrolled growth growth of microorganisms like bacteria in the blood. Okay, so what happens if they grow uncontrollably? Some of them produce uh, endotoxin. Some produce exotoxins. Okay, and some overwhelm the homeostasis and uh, eventually, if it's not uh, controlled, it may lead to non-viability of the organism. It may lead to death. Okay, so that is uh, sepsis. So sepsis was um, ever-present danger um, if um, um, antiseptic... Uh, 
precautions were not taken. So now the question was, um, it was known that, uh, you know, sepsis, in sepsis there was growth of my microorganisms within the blood. So you could prevent the, um, the bacteria from getting into the blood by using these agents. But what do you do if it has already reached the blood? So then the thought was, um, can we have, so the question was, uh, can we have um, antiseptics which can be used uh, internally? Okay, um, can we have antiseptics uh, that can have an internal action which can act internally, meaning it has got which has uh, systemic effects. Okay. So the search for agents having systemic effects began after, in earnest after 1900s. Okay. So there was a need for an agent that would have an activity systemically. In around the um, 1858, around those times, um, around that time there was this uh, gentleman, David Livingston. Okay, so he was a Scottish explorer. And he was in Central Africa. Now those days, there were no roads, so he, what they used was uh, pack animals. And uh, these pack animals used to succumb to something called sleeping sickness. So David Livingston reports that he had administered the uh, inorganic arsenicals, okay, containing arsenic to these uh, pack animals, and apparently there was benefit. So at that time, um, his work um, used to capture the uh, imagination of the masses. He used to come back to England and then um, he used to lecture on his uh, findings. And so um, it happens that uh, this gentleman, Paul Ehrlich, um, Ehrlich was uh, reading the accounts of David Livingston and so he got interested in arsenicals. So what is important to remember here is these inorganic arsenicals were administered uh, orally uh, to the animals and then it had benefit. Okay? Um, so it was not a big uh, leap of imagination for Paul Ehrlich to understand uh, that um, um, these arsenical compounds uh, would get into blood and then it would cause the benefit, okay? Because um, the organism that caused uh, sleeping sickness, the trypanosoma, it was found in the blood, okay? So if um, this was given orally and it produced a benefit, it implied that this compound it went into the blood, and in the blood it killed the organism. Okay, so that was uh, uh, quite something for uh, Paul Ehrlich to comprehend. And he was working on uh, dyes, and those dyes, uh, those uh, chemicals, they had arsenic in them. And so, um, he had this... Um, 
idea that he could um, uh, make an organic arsenical molecule by combining it with the existing dyes to produce uh, something that could um, be used um, against um, the disease syphilis. So at uh, his time, um, this was one of the most uh, prevalent um, diseases, a uh, sexually transmitted disease that was affecting scores of uh, people. And his idea was uh, that he could make um, an arsenical uh, which would be uh, which could be administered uh, orally and it could um, act against uh, this syphilis organism which was found in the blood and which was causing this uh, sexually transmitted disease. And he did just that. Okay? He, the, his group synthesized uh, lots of arsenicals and the 606th compound had activity and it could, uh, it cured syphilis. Okay. And this compound, the 606th compound, um, it is, it was called arsphenamine. Okay, by uh, um, it was also called uh, Selvasan. Okay. And it had a structure that um, was this. And here it was joined with the arsenic, uh, with the double bond there. Okay, so it was basically an organic um, arsenical compound. Okay, so arsenic, uh, inorganic one is um, really toxic. So. Um, this was uh, organified. Um, so this is an organic molecule and this molecule had uh, activity against syphilis and it could uh, cure. Okay. Um, so um, the idea was that this compound it could um, attach to the um, the trepo treponema organism and it could kill that organism without affecting the host. So the concept of uh, magic bullet um, was laid down. So you could give this uh, compound it could go into the blood and it would def it would target only the um, the causative organism of um, syphilis and it would spare the um, cells and tissues of the body. So the concept of uh, magic bullet um, um, resulted. Okay, and this was eventually worked upon by uh, uh, Domag again. So again. Um, so, this is um, the contribution of uh, Paul Ehrlich, okay. So, he had laid down the principle, um, uh, he had also basically propounded the principle of selective toxicity and that uh, is what uh, nowadays we refer to as the magic bullet, okay, selectively targeting an organism, okay. So, um, um, this happened in the year 1910. Um, yeah, so the story of the sleeping sickness, they, they again in, I think, in 1900 and um, um, before 1910, there was also a publication uh, talking about how um, an organic arsenical organic arsenical 
um, was effective against sleeping sickness. Okay, but it was a different arsenical compound and um, that was published by a gentleman called uh, Thomas. Okay, so this gentleman um, experimentally proved that this organical compound was effective against uh, sleeping sickness. Uh, this was in the year 1905. Okay. Okay. So Paul Ehrlich basically um, followed up upon this work. Okay. All right. So that is the contribution of Paul Ehrlich. So Thomas basically was uh, working on so this organic arsenical which was worked upon by Thomas, um, it had a structure like this. Okay. Uh, so it was an organic arsenical, as we previously mentioned. It had a structure. And we said it was an organic arsenical, so there was arsenic. And... Uh, So this was the compound that he administered, and this is called uh, atoxyl. Okay. Um, so following up on this work, um, Paul Ehrlich ended up with salvarsal. In uh, 1932, so in 1932, Gerhard Domag followed up upon this uh, line of reasoning. So he thought, um, um, in, in place of arsenic, now salvarsan, if we think about it, the, it still has got arsenic and that leads to toxicity. So his idea was, can I use a dye that does not have arsenic? Okay? And so he thought, why can't I use um, azo dyes? Okay? Azo dyes is uh, having uh, um, this um, structure in place of arsenic. So can I use um, azo dyes to come up with uh, something that will be selectively tox uh, toxic to microorganisms? And indeed he came up. Uh, he came up with this. Okay, it's interesting this structure. Okay, so this was a azo dye, and its name is uh, prontosa. Okay, so he was so confident about this um, compound, and from his studies that he. Um, enabled the first clinical trial, and this was in um, 1933. Okay, it was administered to a patient, a child. And the child um, um, was under the care of a doctor. Uh, Foster. Okay, and the child um, was uh, having um, was having sepsis. Okay, and um, 
so in this drug uh, in this patient the drug was administered and uh, miraculously the the temperature dropped and the child was uh, healed she became uh, um, um normal in a couple of days she was she was healed okay that uh, led so this was in 1933 he worked in 1932 and in one 1939 he got the nobel prize in medicine and physiology okay um so this compound so, so he was working on it uh, he put it into a patient and then he got the nobel prize subsequently studies on this compound showed that um, this compound Uh, was not active in vitro okay so what is in vitro um say you you have a culture plate you take a culture plate and you grow bacteria in it and you take uh, this drug uh, dissolve it and then spread it over this um uh, culture then you don't find antibacterial activity okay so this means it's it has got no activity in vitro however you give it to an animal say a rabbit having uh, infected with the microorganism so imagine that's a rabbit um you give this um, drug to the animal having the disease and the animal gets cured okay yeah. so then the idea was someone uh, took a rat okay and like the rabbit administered uh, this drug to the rat and collected its urine okay yeah. and uh, Uh, kind of separated uh, um, the urine from all the um, other extraneous material because collecting urine from rat it's often contaminated with feces uh, so filtered and so on and got the filtrate and then tried this filtrate on this plate and lo and behold he got activity okay got antibacterial activity so then what was happening okay so now uh, one has to explain what's happening okay so um if you do an in vitro study you don't have activity you give it to an animal take its urine you take the filtrate and test it for antibacterial activity it has activity okay so uh, the explanation could be that when you administer this drug to the rat the rat somehow changes it chemically and that changed form it is excreted in the urine and that changed form has got activity okay so so the idea became that the metabolite of pronto uh, cell pronto cell in the body undergoes metabolism and the metabolite has got activity okay so now the question was what is the structure of the metabolite okay so the metabolite was isolated and its structure was found out okay and the structure of the metabolite was the structure of the metabolite was and this is sulfonylamide okay so it was found out that uh, from this uh, understanding led to one to understand that uh, the activity resides in this particular area of the pronto cell structure okay and um, 
uh, so Paul Ehrlich, when he prepared uh, uh, 606 compounds, what he was doing was uh, coming up with different structures, okay? And when he found activity in the 606th compound, uh, he could now say that the structure is responsible for activity. So he laid the foundation of what is called the structure activity relationship. SAR, okay, structure activity relationship. Okay, so uh, Paul Ehrlich had this idea that structure is responsible for activity. So now that the um, active uh, structure was found out, there were studies to um, synthesize uh, derivatives. So this area was modified and uh, this area was modified to yield derivatives which were then tested for antibacterial activity. Okay, those uh, synthesized derivatives were tested and those that had antimicrobial activity came to be called the sulfur drugs. So this in a nutshell is the history of uh, sulfonamides.